Hi, my name is Claire Schlaff. I am a member of the Comores Environmental Impact Committee, known as SEEK. This presentation examines reasons for the 62-year delay in the cleanup of contamination in soil and groundwater at a former DuPont property, now owned by the Comores Company. Portions of this property meet the shoreline of both White Lake and Lake Michigan in northern Muskegon County. This presentation will examine reasons why this cleanup has taken so long. We will look at how environmental laws have contributed to the delay of the cleanup of this property. Some of these pages will contain a great deal of information. You are able to listen and or go back later and review the information at your own pace. There are links provided throughout the presentation that will take you to more information. Let me mention the main points in this table of contents. Section 1, It's Been a Long Time, provides a timeline and a look at the people who have given their time over the decades trying to get this site cleaned up. Section 2 looks at a few maps to orient you to the property and its landfills and areas of concern. Sections 3, 4, 5, and 6 explore factors that have contributed to the delay in this cleanup industry practices, federal and state policies, and our hazardous waste laws. Section 7 describes the strain this has had on our community and how it has forced us to hold off on our vision, which includes preservation of natural habitats, restoration of waterways, and conservation that might include public access. In case there are acronyms that are unfamiliar, you might find them on this page. Here are definitions of some of the terminology used. It's been a very long time. In 1961, a resident living southwest of the DuPont Montague property reported taste and odor problems in his well water. This prompted DuPont to launch an investigation. Now, in 2023, the investigations continue, along with studies to determine what remedial actions might apply that would keep exposures under control based on intended future use of the property. The Comores Environmental Impact Committee, known as SEEK, formed in 2018 to advocate for the cleanup of the former DuPont property. DuPont had created Comores as a spin-off company in 2015, and Comores became the owner and responsible party for this contaminated site. Prior to 2015, the White Lake Public Advisory Council advocated for the cleanup of the DuPont property for 22 years. Prior to 1992, individuals and small groups publicly expressed their concerns. We now have generations of people who have sacrificed their time as volunteers to get this site cleaned up. Despite years of research and communications with DuPont, Comores, and the hazardous waste section of our state environmental agency about this cleanup, our community feels as though we have made no progress. There seems to be no movement toward getting the sources of the contamination cleaned up. What's the problem? I want to show you maps of DuPont's property, the plumes of contaminated groundwater, and the lime pile in Mirror Lake. This map shows the outline of the DuPont Comores 1330-acre property and the locations of the unlined landfills and spill areas resulting from DuPont's production of neoprene and freon. Note the portions of this property that extend to the shorelines of both White Lake and Lake Michigan. The purpose of the narrow strip of land on the west is to accommodate the pipeline to Lake Michigan. There are two plumes of contaminated groundwater. The plume from the manufacturing area flows southeast toward White Lake. The plume from Pearson Creek landfill flows southwest toward Pearson Creek. A 2021 Comores report lists these areas as the likely sources of the manufacturing area plume. 
The orange, green, and pink lines in the plume represent the three main contaminants in the groundwater. This is a close-up of the manufacturing area plume, close to the lake. Note the locations of the interceptor wells, the yellow dots, that pump water within the capture zone, the purple dotted line, and remove the contaminants using air stripper technology. The treated water is sent through the pipeline to Lake Michigan, monitored through a federal permitting process. Note also the mixing zone compliance wells, red dots, located beyond the west and east edges of the capture zone. The lime pile and Mirror Lake, to be discussed soon, are also visible on this map. According to the same 2021 document, the chemicals in the groundwater from the Pearson Creek landfill near the western edge of the property are understood to be related to settled materials from the surface impoundment at the east edge of the property. The 1996 Historical Spills document states that these liquid and solid wastewater treatment residues were trucked one mile west of the plant and placed in a depression in the ground. That depression happened to be located 250 feet uphill from Pearson Creek. The orange line represents the outer edges of the area where chemicals can be detected. Pearson Creek runs through this area. There are no interceptor wells within this plume. Pearson Creek is upstream from Sedoni Bayou and White Lake, which empties into Lake Michigan. This list marks, one, the timing of the decision to store the lime byproduct from acetylene production in a, quote, low-lying area, which was actually a stream bed and a ravine. Two, the break in the wall that resulted in lime slurry flowing into Mirror Lake. And three, estimates of the volume of the lime pile and attempts to remove it through mining and marketing. These photos from 1962, 2019, and 2023 show the lime pile, easily seen in satellite imagery, and the lime in Mirror Lake. This photo by reporter Garrett Ellison in 2023 illustrates the immense size of the lime pile. The excavators in this photo look like ants on a glacier. Ellison also captured both White Lake and Lake Michigan in this photo, further demonstrating the tragedy of this monstrosity in an otherwise picturesque setting. In Section 3, we look at industry practices that I believe have contributed to the delay in this cleanup. Sometimes we may tend to give industries a pass, give, figuring that they didn't know any better when they dumped sludges into pits dug in sandy soils with no liners that happened to be uphill from nearby waterways. The following will show this is not the case. Newspapers tell the story. Town leaders and newspaper editors and reporters seemed to be giddy with excitement when Hooker Chemical and DuPont wanted to bring their industries and their jobs to the White Lake area. That began to change in the 1960s. News that DuPont had to pay for a new water main extension from the city of Montague to supply clean water to residents in a resort area near the DuPont facility. News of the 1967 fish kill after DuPont's wastewater had been diverted into Pearson Creek and other stories. Consider this 1992 investigation report about DuPont's landfill practices, amounting to holes dug in sand. The landfills were not engineered with liners or leachate collection systems. Disposal practices consisted of excavating an area into the natural soils and filling it with waste. What did they know in 1950? Quote, Groundwater contamination prompted public health officials to take action in California, New York, and Michigan prior to 1950. And in the 1950s, manufacturers were warned to avoid surface impoundments. 
cautioning that lagoons might increase the risk of nuisance suits. It also pointed out that waste disposers recognized that wastes could travel substantial distances with the groundwater flow without significant dilution or degradation, and lagoons are potentially a, quote, highly inadequate chemical waste treatment. There were no laws yet to stop this type of behavior. Next, I will give four examples of DuPont Camours choosing to do things that appear to have been to avoid cleaning up contamination. The 1996 DuPont Historical Spills Document reports that releases in the south wall of their lime pile in the 60s and 70s resulted in lime slurry flowing down a ravine into Mirror Lake. In response to the groundwater contamination that also occurred, the company reported that they had purchased 34 acres of land southeast of the Montague facility, signifying that DuPont had obtained adequate control of the groundwater under the site. The report then concluded, quote, the DuPont Montague facility has adequately and effectively addressed any concerns pertaining to the lime pile. The parcels shown on this map, purchased by DuPont and now owned by Camores, were in the neighborhood of residents whose well water had been contaminated and who had been provided drinking water piped from the city of Montague. Our community is tired of hearing about attenuation, decreasing concentrations of chemicals over time, and daughter products. This term has been used to describe chemicals breaking down into different chemicals. The EPA says that monitored natural attenuation, MNA, is selected when any contaminant source has been removed and only low concentrations of chemicals remain in soil or groundwater. The anticipated cleanup time for MNA must be reasonable compared to that of other more active methods. At the DuPont Camores site, it seems as though monitored natural attenuation is being used to try to avoid cleaning up the sources of the contamination. The problem is that they have assuredly gone past the, quote, reasonable anticipated cleanup time for use of MNA as a method. In 2004, DuPont was considering bioremediation and reactive barrier technologies to address their contaminated groundwater problem. But they rejected those options and chose to install additional interceptor wells closer to the lake, coupled with a mixing zone permit. The mixing zone was granted by the state in 2007, and this sy system continues today. In 2023, bioremediation and permeable reactive barriers are still considered to be effective technologies. However, they have not been used at this site. By zooming in on this 2006 DuPont photo of Mirror Lake, looking north toward the lime pile, you can see the height of the lime pile above the trees. A local eyewitness who played and explored at Mirror Lake as a child remembers the late 1950s when DuPont built a huge sand dam at the north end of the lake across the ravine from hillside to hillside. They laid a large concrete pipe north to south through the bottom of the dam. The eyewitness, then seven years old, crawled through the pipe from the south to the north, emerging to see the ravine, still beautiful. But then, over the next few years, the ravine was filled with lime sludge, covering everything, full-grown trees and all. Then the first break occurred in the wall of the lime pond. In 1962, lime slurry flowed into Mirror Lake. Other eyewitnesses who were fortunate enough to have experienced Mirror Lake as children prior to its desecration describe it as a wildlife paradise, home to at least five species of ducks, as well as mink, muskrats, red-tailed hawks, and ruffed grouse. Kids delighted in the frogs, bugs, and all things to thrill any child, a veritable nature center for young children. 
Mirror Lake often offered the first ice of the season for skating and hockey, hockey as winter arrived. Inclines were perfect for sledding and tobogganing. DuPont's 2018 corrective studies work plan describes it this way. The lime byproduct was stored in a low-lying area located south of Wilkes Road, north of Mirror Lake. That low-lying area was a stream bed and ravine north of Mirror Lake, visible in these 1938, 1950, and 1955 aerial photos from a 2012 document. By the time the 1962 aerial photo was taken, the stream and ravine had already been filled with lime sludge, which had also leached into the northern half of Mirror Lake. DuPont's 2012 Remedial Action Report provided these photos and stated that the lime sediment in Mirror Lake, quote, is stable with no apparent change since the late 1960s and that no further erosion of lime southward has occurred since that time. Reading the text, it feels as though we are supposed to be happy that there has been no further erosion. Now, in Section 4, let's look at federal and state policies that may have been factors in delaying the cleanup of the dupont Comores site. Medium priority designation, no enforceable document, and communication problems with the hazardous waste section of EGLE. This is a screenshot of a 2010 presentation by DNRE, now EGLE. The DuPont Montague facility is ranked as a medium priority according to the National Corrective Action Prioritization System, or NCAPS. Because of this designation, the priority for the site is on meeting environmental indicator, EI, milestones, which are assuring that human exposures are under control and that migration of contaminated groundwater is under control. This is the next page of this 2010 presentation, which includes this statement about the Waste Hazardous Materials Division's focus. WHMD's focus has been on high NCAP sites and controlling exposures at lower priority sites as the DuPont Montague facility. I think there should be a procedure to move sites to a high priority ranking by NCAPs when a community has languished through decades of inaction due to a site's ranking as a medium priority. We have been told from the same 2010 presentation and from meetings with the hazardous waste section of EGLE that corrective action for the dupont Comores site has been conducted on a, quote, voluntary basis with oversight from the state. Our understanding is that Comores submits its reports and plans to the state, and then the state reviews the plans to see if they follow the law. In a 2018 Corrective Measures Study Work Plan, Comores mentioned a voluntary corrective action agreement between Comores and MDEQ. MDEQ was the State Department in 2018. A year later, a letter from the State Department, now changed to EGLE, informed Comores that there is no formal voluntary corrective action agreement in place between Comores and EGLE, and that the MMD, Materials Management Division of EGLE, is working on an enforceable document to address the corrective action obligations at the facility. Now, in 2023, negotiations are still underway for an enforceable document. The bullet points here describe the negotiation process, the limits of public involvement in the process, SEEK's attempts to submit items to be listed in the CACO, concerns raised by Comores, and the latest estimate of a timeline for this enforceable document to be executed. The corrective action consent order should have been in place decades ago. This page verifies that corrective action objectives require meaningful opportunities for public engagement. SEEK is intensely focused on the cleanup of the Comores property. We meet at least twice monthly with several members putting in many hours of time between meetings, educating ourselves. 
We depend on information and on communications with the hazardous waste section of EGO. On the next page, we have a couple of suggestions for improving information sharing and communication procedures between HWS and communities such as ours living near contaminated sites. Problem number one, some documents are not available to seek and we have to specifically ask HWS to either send them to us or add them to Eagles Camores Montague website. This is burdensome for both SEEK and HWS. Perhaps all documents could be uploaded to Eagles facility specific corrective action information websites so that the public won't have to submit individual requests for each document and HWS professionals will be able to make better use of their time. Problem number two, SEEK has often had difficulty getting a response from HWS when we have tried to request information, meetings, and or updates. Suggestion, develop a system whereby meetings between HWS and community groups are regularly scheduled and information is routinely shared with or without individual requests. The purpose of Section 5 is to understand our various federal and state hazardous waste laws and when and how they came about. RICRA, enacted in 1976, was and is the main federal law to ensure that hazardous waste is managed safely. In 1986, the Environmental Protection Agency gave Michigan the authority to administer hazardous waste through NREPA, Part 111. Part 111 contains requirements known as corrective action, which we will talk about later. Before we explore the correction action process further, we need to understand another Michigan state law, Part 201. The backstory of Part 201 begins with another federal law known as CERCLA, enacted in 1980. This law is known as the Superfund Law because it established liability and it also had a system to provide funding for cleanups for sites that qualified. In 1982, MIRA became the Michigan counterpart of CERCLA. MIRA had been acted in 1982. In 1990, state legislative amendments imposed strict liability on owners of contaminated sites extending government rights to clean up contaminated sites. MIRA became known as Michigan's polluter pay law. Then, in the early 1990s, industries were able to change the law. In 1994, due to concerns that MIRA burdened property transactions, the state legislature amended MIRA, which then became NREPA Part 201. Evidently, it no longer fit under the Superfund polluter pay umbrella. Part 201 reforms were enacted in 1995. Now, Part 111 corrective action rules require compliance with Part 201 standards. Next, let's look at the corrective action process, noting the influence of Part 201 standards. In Section 6, we look at risk-based management and how it has changed and prolonged the cleanup due to investigations that focus on chances of exposure rather than presence of chemicals in groundwater. Then we'll look specifically at the landfills and areas of concern being studied and studied some more at the Comores site. We'll also look at some of the consequences and inequities inaccurate assumptions that can occur using this approach to management of hazardous waste. Then, are there reforms in the wind? The state legislature's overhaul of NREPA's Part 201 shifted corrective action to a risk-based framework that no longer required cleaning of contaminated sites to background levels, that is, levels of chemicals that would occur naturally in the environment. Ironically, the thinking was that this would expedite redevelopment of contaminated properties by reducing legal obligations. Instead, it slowed cleanups, 
such as the Dupont Camor site in Montague. Now the focus was to mitigate rather than eliminate unacceptable risks to public health. We can no longer know how clean is clean. Basing cleanup on intended future use of the property means that properties zoned residential are cleaned up to a higher standard than properties zoned industrial. Posting use restrictions, such as deed restrictions, relies on the assumption that once posted, that restriction will stay in place and that no one will ever be exposed to the contamination. Part 201 is based on a presumption that institutional controls can be a substitute for engineering controls, such as landfill removal or bioremediation. The EPA's Superfund website emphasizes that institutional controls are meant to supplement engineering controls and that they will rarely be the sole remedy at a site. It is our fear that Comores may be planning to impose use restrictions as an alternative to removing some of their landfills or using remediation technologies. Here are the steps in the corrective action process. Volumes of data have been collected about the DuPont Comores site during the history and investigation steps. We have now been in the Corrective Measures Study, CMS, phase for several years, during which DuPont and Comores have been studying the data to determine cleanup plans. This study continues on, holding up all cleanups, including removal of landfills known to be leaking chemicals into the groundwater. Here's a close-up of the map shown earlier, identifying the 15 waste management units and areas of concern that have been identified as needing remediation. I have listed these investigation reports that have been written since Part 111 was enacted in 1986. There were also many, many semi-annual monitoring reports. In September 2012, our community was told that the WMU's AOCs in the shaded area had been reviewed and no further action was required. The state was currently reviewing the remaining 11 units and said, this would take months. Our question is, do corrective action procedures require that all WMU's AOCs on the site be thoroughly studied for decades if necessary before cleanup of waste of, of any one unit may be conducted? If so, there should be a mandated time limit for an enforceable document to be enacted, especially when there are multiple WMU's and AOC's on a site. This list of 11 units gives us as a sense of potential options that Comores might be considering for each unit. Note that these were listed in a 2018 work plan and we are now in 2023 and still waiting. This table shows that institutional controls and monitored natural attenuation are options that Comores might be considering rather than removal or use of remediation technologies. The last five columns consider capping a man landfill, on-site treatment, off-site disposal, on-site reuse, and on-site consolidation into an engineered, properly lined landfill. Part 201's focus on controlling human exposures rather than cleaning up the sources of the contamination can lead to inaccurate assumptions. For example, Statements that appeared in three reports in 2012, 2013, and 2014 dismissed the possibilities of humans being exposed to contamination in Pearson Creek. Number one, Pearson Creek and its tributaries do not provide any recreational value. In reality, local residents speak of their memories of their enjoyment of the creek. Number two, any waiting activities would be limited to occasional trespassing. This may be a navigable waterway because it is connected to White Lake. If so, waiters are not trespassers. Number three, routine maintenance activities do not occur in the creek. A huge Pearson drain restoration project was completed in 2018. 
Thanks to a recent grant awarded by Eagle to our community, plants are in, plans are in the works to continue the restoration of the creek southward. What have been the costs of the decisions to hold off on a landfill removals and source remediations until the corrective action process has been completed? Costs to the industry. What if they had removed some of these landfills decades ago as compared to where we are now decades later? Costs to the state in taxpayer dollars and time spent. Immeasurable, often hidden costs to our community. For more about Part 201's negative consequences, see this 2023 report. In Michigan, polluter liability can be elusive, but reforms are in the wind by Garrett Ellison. Section 7. How has this affected our community? What is our vision for the future, and what do we want? 1961, the year the groundwater contamination was revealed, was a long time ago. Generations used their time trying to get this cleaned up. Generations have been deprived of the enjoyment of lands and waterways that were once treasured wonderlands for children and adults. Contamination in any community causes people to worry. This 1950s map from a member of the White Lake Area Historical Society shows their passion about the conservation of Long Point on White Lake. This map from a 2005 community action plan highlights the Long Point portion of the Comores property as being of greatest priority for habitat protection in the White Lake area. Muskegon County officials are interested in the prospect of the Comores property being conserved as a Muskegon County public park. Here are the high quality areas that are shown in green. Leaders from several entities throughout Muskegon County have been working for years on a plan for an extension of the existing bike trail all the way to Medbury Park at the White Lake Channel. They can't complete their plans until the cleanup of the Comores property is enacted. In 2023, our community has, was awarded an Eagle Grant to begin an evaluation of Sedoni Bayou for the purpose of restoration. Many individuals and groups in the White Lake area have been advocating for preservation and or conservation of the undisturbed portions of the Comores property. We did meet with Comores about this a few years ago, and they have said they are in favor of a nature preserve of some sort. But nothing can happen until cleanup plans are in place or the cleanup has been completed. Seek likes to close our presentations with a What We Want page. This version includes advocacy toward changing policies and laws that have prevented the cleanup of this site. Here are some of the references used in this presentation. Other references, those citing the sources of maps and photos that were used, appear on their respective pages. Please join us. Send an email to makeitrightcomores at gmail.com and or visit us on Facebook. Thank you for taking the time to study this issue.